was Ndidi who started the Center for Memories with some other people, including the last speaker, Nkem Mweke. He's a board member of the Center. And Didi had this vision of bringing Igbo people to know their history, their language, and their culture. And she felt that we needed to be proud of being Igbo. So that was the vision behind this Center for Memories. And it started about two years ago. It's been in existence for two years. And it's in Enogo, Independence Layout. I hope you'll get to see it. But I also want you to start something like that here in Abakaliki. I think you really need it. Am I right? I'm fearing that today's youth don't know much about their history. I don't know if I'm right. And don't you think that's a shame? When we heard the last speaker, he was telling us we have to be more into technology. I'm in favor of that. But I also want us to be into history. So the center was the result of five years of planning. The idea came out of a meeting called Olan Dibo, which was held in Lagos October 2013. And at that meeting, the idea was started to have a center for memories. It took five years. And it's still evolving. I can't say that we've finished. We're in a rented accommodation, and we would like to have our own building, but I don't know if we're there yet. I keep looking at this TED Talks and what the people, the organizers have achieved. It's quite daunting to start a new venture. I read the book before I came by Martin Elechi, 39 years to start Ebony State. You know that Chinese proverb, Every journey begins with the first step. It's very hard to start anything. So we have to salute the organizers of this event for all they have come. So they started this center by raising money. Money is always necessary. And they had very good people who agreed to host fundraisers in their house. Some of them were uh, Ike Chioke, Professor Pat Utomi, different individuals just invited friends and they donated money. And that is how it started. So the first day they opened, December 28th, 2018, was a big occasion. They had this poet, Ikogu Oke, he has since died. I don't know if you've heard of him. He spoke in Igbo and recited his poems, and he was accompanied by a flutist. It was very beautiful. They had a dramatic presentation by Amarachi Atama. Have you heard of her? She's so talented. It was beautiful. They had traditional dancing. They had a choir singing the national anthem in Igbo. It was really a beautiful day. So that was the opening. Now the first exhibit, very inspiring. I consider history inspiring. I hope you do. And the first exhibit was about famous Igbos in different walks of life. Akanu Ibiem was there. He's my favorite. And he's from Ebony State. And I understand that he was one of the people who started this Ebony State movement, and his presence was very necessary in the achievement of Ebony State. When he was sick, I think it was 90, he was up to 94 years, I think, was he? And he went to Abuja to meet the, president, the head of state, who was Abacha at that time, even though he was sick, because he believed in that state and he was instrumental in the founding. So he's in that first exhibit, along with many others, 
from music, from literature, art, politics, and we have biographies of each one of them. So the idea was to inspire the youths to teach them about the famous Igbo people in different walks of life. That was the first exhibit. Now this is one of our favorite programs, Nzuko Umaka. It's a bi-weekly program for children, and we try to run it completely in Igbo language. And they tell folk tales, sing songs, teach uh, games, and try to encourage Igbo language for children. We recently got a grant from OSIWA, that is Open Society Institute of West Africa, to improve this program, to make it even reach more children. It's a good program because we found when they tell folk tales in Igbo, many of the children can't understand them. Some children are growing up and they can't speak Igbo. Ebuka confessed to me that he doesn't speak Igbo. I don't know where he grew up. <laughs> so we were lucky, and Didi knows the people at Fidelity, and they donated a container. And that is where we have the children's library. So twice a month now, the children can come and read books, and then we have these programs to encourage Igbo language. Now this Nkata Umibe is one of our favorite programs. It's a monthly series where we have speakers on different topics. Yesterday was the monthly talk, and we had a woman who was the person who took those girls from Onicha to Silicon Valley. You heard about her. Amazing. They won first place in the competition. She's very dedicated. You know what she told us yesterday? When she came back from Silicon Valley, she said, but that's only five girls. That's not enough. I have to get thousands of girls. <laughs> she wasn't tired. She's a very young person. I think she's under 40. And she's so uh, very dedicated and committed to improving the STEM program. So this in Kata, we have a speaker every month. We've had D.K. Chukumurije, Aik Chioke, Niamodo, Choma Mbanefo. There's so many names there. And I know you can't get to Enlugu on Friday, the first Friday every month, but I, I think you could start a program. This is actually the same type of program. It's just only one speaker a month. So the second exhibit, the current exhibit we have, is Reviving Lost Technologies. Uh, many of these technologies are lost, like uh, something like Iboku art. Have you heard of Iboku art? Well, that was a lost technology. It was from 9th century AD. They were making bronze sculptures and vessels, and then it died. And nobody today in Iboku knows how they got those bronzes. So when the site was discovered, and it was excavated by a British man, Thurston Shaw, 1959, he said they didn't make the bronzes, that these must have come from somewhere. The people there don't know anything about making bronze today. But it has since been proven that he was wrong. But it's hard to change people's mind. But what they found was that there are many sites with these bronzes. That shows that it was widespread. Then they have found that there are sources for the materials, like copper, to make the bronzes. And the type of bronze they made was very unusual. The technique they used is called lost wax technique. It's not found anywhere else. They had Benin bronze, they had Ife bronze, but they didn't use the same technique. They used tin. These people used copper. So we believe that this was indigenous technology. Another example of indigenous technology is Leja, near Nsuka. 
They made iron. Iron was produced in Leja going back 2,500 years ago. But if you go to Leja today and they ask the people, they don't know where this iron came from. They never uh, knew how to make iron. And they, that is a lost technology. That is the, the shame or the sadness about it. That these were indigenous technologies, they were advanced technologies, but nobody knows how to make it today. An example of a technology that still exists is aquete cloth. Do you know what is aquete cloth? It's dying. Nobody wants to make it anymore. It's not selling. People say it's too expensive. It's not in vogue. So aquete is dying. Something like blacksmithing and wood carving. Dying. There's nobody to carry on the tradition. I come from Aka. My husband is from Aka. They can't find any young men today to be blacksmiths or wood carvers. They don't see it as a viable profession. There are no more apprentices. It's only a few old people still doing it. They can't pass on their knowledge. So that is the uh, exhibit we have now. This is an example of Ibuku art. These are the Akwete cloths. This is the Oka carvers. Now, there, our exhibit coming up is on the Civil War. When we started the museum, it was to remember the Civil War, the Biafran War. And we are now in this process of collecting artifacts, doing interviews about the Civil War. And I appeal to all of you to help. If you happen to have any photographs, or if you have anybody in your family who can tell stories about the Civil War, you can help us. You can interview them and tape them, and we can include it in the museum. We are still looking for more things. I looked up before I came to find out about the Civil War in Abakaliki. And I read, as I told you, Martin Elechi's book. So I read his account of his role in the Civil War. Do you know his role in the Civil War? Does anybody know? Did you read the book? He joined the Nigerian site. <laughs> he was a traitor to Biafra. He looked at the situation. He said, I don't think Biafra is going to win. The best, best thing for me is to join the Nigerians. So as soon as Abakliki fell, according to what he wrote in the book, that was in, um, I think it was in 1968, Abakliki fell. Then he rushed over to the Nigerian armed forces. And the head of the group in Abakliki was Jemmy Biwan. He later became a governor, a Yoruba man. He was a colonel in the Nigerian army. So he went to him and he said, we want to be on the Nigerian side. Can you help us? Can you protect us? And Jemmy Biwan had a connection to Martin Elechi. By coincidence, Martin Elechi went to university in the Congo, in Leopoldville. And that is just where Jemmy Biwan was stationed when the Nigerians contributed to the United Nations peacekeeping force in the Congo. You know, there was something like secession in the Congo. Katanga seceded, and then the UN stepped in to keep peace, and Nigerians were there. So Martin Elechi happened to go to school in the Congo, and he met these Nigerians in the army. So when it came time for him to join the Nigerians, he went to Jemmy Biwan, and he was taken in. So they actually protected him, and he joined the Nigerian side. So that's just one Civil War story. You may have a story like that. Maybe somebody in your family didn't like Biafra, and they decided to join Nigeria. Maybe not. But we're interested in collecting the stories. We're interested in collecting stories about Afia attack. You know what is Afia attack? That is women who went over to trade with the enemy. And they were considered heroines 
because they were supporting their family. Many of them kept their families alive. Their husbands could not go, and they risked their lives. You know that in um, Half of a Yellow Sun, one of the main characters goes over and trades with the enemy to get food for the family, and she is killed. Kainene, one of the twin sisters. So it was a risky business, and it showed a lot of courage. So we're also interested in collecting stories about women who were in the Afia tech. So I am encouraging all of you to join us in our hope of collecting the past and putting it in museums. And maybe one of you will be instrumental in starting a center for memories here in Abakliki. <laughs>